Have you guys been enjoying the con so far? Yeah? All right. Good afternoon. My name is Jeff Mann. I am uh, here to talk to you today about does DOD security work in the real world? Does anybody here work for the DOD or a DOD contractor? Yes, sort of. I'm sorry. You look so enthusiastic about it. Um, yeah, there's that. We'll try to keep this a little bit informal. This talk is really meant to be a discussion starter. Um, it's just some ideas that I had that I put together in a talk. Um, so feel free to interject, uh, throw things at me, agree or disagree. Um, let's start off with a quick survey. Uh, does DOD security work in the real world? Uh, first, we might want to define our terms, uh, but we'll get to that. But just right off the top of your head, who thinks, yes, it does or it could work in the real world? Not DOD. <laughs> private sector. Public sector, private sector. We have public and private refer to the same thing. How about no? Don't think it works in the real world. Don't be afraid. Don't be bashful. I may are just waiting for me to get on with what I want to say about it or let's get this thing over and head to the city beer hall. All right. Um, well, the reason I, I named this talk, Does DOD Security Work in the Real World, is because uh, many years ago, probably it's been almost 10 years ago, I was, I was doing a uh, PCI assessment for a merchant that had uh, gone through a pretty major breach. So they had they'd gotten religion, they were doing things right, but they didn't really understand a lot of the security controls that they were having to follow. And uh, I am uh, I'm getting ahead of my slides a little bit, but I, I'm ex NSA and I was trained as a cryptanalyst. So when we got to the uh, to the part of PCI where it says you need to protect your data at rest. We spent an afternoon where I probably spent a, more detail than they wanted going into what are the differences between hashes and truncation and cryptography and stuff like that. They didn't really understand the basics of cryptography. So I spent a good deal of time, probably geeked out on them a little bit, telling them about what this thing called encryption was. And they said to me, yeah, but we don't really need DOD level security. We just sell fill in the blank. It was sort of a department store, a women's clothing store. So that's actually stuck in my head over the last many years. I, I've always remembered that conversation, and I've always remembered that statement that this person said, yeah, we don't really need DOD's level security. So hold that thought. Um, as I said, I, I started uh, in the Department of Defense. Um, this is me, by the way. My name is Jeff Mann. I am one of the co-hosts in Security Weekly. Did anybody have a chance to get recorded? Did you, but you went over to the booth. Did anybody play Hacker Movie Trivia? No? I think they're packing up now. You missed your chance. Um, I was a QSA. I was a pen tester at NSA. I was a crypto analyst at NSA. If you want to get in touch with me, it's Jeff at securityweekly.net, and that's my Twitter handle. Um, I spent about 13 years total in the Department of Defense, and I've been out of there in the private public sector for a little over 20 years. And uh, somewhere along the line, I just got into doing PCI and ended up doing PCI as a QSA for 10 years. Um, last couple of years, I was working for a, a software company, a, a security company, and they had me get into the, doing this whole evangelism, thought leadership, go out and do public speaking thing. And uh, I've kind of kept doing that. I'm no longer with that company. But uh, people seem to enjoy my talks. They like to hear the history. I'm a dinosaur. Uh, I talk a little bit about ancient history in terms of security, which you're going to get a little bit of today. And uh, yeah, so that's me. Uh, just a little uh, story about NSA. Um, last, Early last year, I believe, a, a book was published called Dark Territory, The Secret History of the Cyber War by Fred Kaplan. Anybody heard of it or read it? Got one person. Um, you'll notice chapter four is entitled Eligible Receiver. And in that chapter, there's a paragraph that states, and I'll read it to you because I like to do it dramatically. Uh, the NSA had a similar group called the Red Team. It was part of the Information Assurance Directorate, formerly called the Information Security Directorate. 
the defensive side of the NSA, stationed in Fanex, the building out near Friendship Airport. During its most sensitive drills, the Red Team worked out of a chamber called the Pit, which was so secret that few people at NSA knew it existed, and even they couldn't enter without first passing through two combination locked doors. So, that sounds very dramatic, and it's probably 90% true. Um, I happened to be part of the first red team at NSA, and we worked in an office. We had desks and cubicles, and we were trying to live the hacker culture, so we nicknamed our office The Pit, and somehow that grew into this legend. Um, but uh, this is the uh, Fan X complex, which is really F-A-N-X. They spelled it E-X in the book, so it was a little bit off. Uh, has anybody ever flown into or out of BWI Airport in Baltimore, Maryland? Yes, no, maybe. If if you have, if you ever do, this the road at the top there is the road that just goes right into the terminal. So you pass all these buildings on the left side. That's Fanex 3, and in that corner of the building is where the pit actually was. So it really existed. It was just our office. We were a bunch of guys trying to be cool and you know, talk hacker speak and live the hacker culture, and somehow that morphed into legend. So for what it's worth. Um, this woman, Becky Bass, uh, she was one of my mentors at NSA. She actually just passed away this year rather suddenly back in March, I believe it was. Um, she's She was really one of the pioneers of InfoSec, especially out in the private sector. She she helped a lot of companies get their start. She, she helped uh, not just necessarily investing in them, but believing in them. Uh, especially women in the industry, she she uh, mentored and helped a lot of people. Uh, and I've been dedicating my talks this year in her memory. We literally did call her mom. She was she was sort of our den mother in the pit. And I actually found out uh, in in going to a couple memorial services for her, I found out even more so how she was sort of behind the scenes, uh, convincing senior management that it was okay that. NSA had a, some guys doing this hacking pen testing thing. Um, so she's in large ways responsible for a lot of my career. So this is dedicated to Becky. Um, my career actually started back in 1984. It was actually before I went to NSA. Um, but we used to have t-shirts that had that on it. Um, my first job with the Department of Defense was with the Navy. And uh, it was this place called Naval Surface Weapons Center. And uh, I was a summer intern, and I had this really cool job. I got hired by a physicist that was working in anti-submarine warfare, and uh, he had this filing cabinet, this locking safe, filled with about 20, 25 years' worth of research material that he had collected uh, during the course of his career. And he had been able to get some money together and bought this newfangled thing called a desktop PC and some database programming software. And so my job for the summer was to kind of build a rudimentary database, play around with the computer, go through the safe, look at all the documents, and try to come up with some sort of searchable database. Um, when I started, he was trying to describe to me what anti-submarine warfare was. And he said, well, you know, there's this book that came out recently and it explains it as well as I could. So the first week of my job with the government was I got to sit and read this book, The Hunt for Red October. I thought that was pretty cool. Um, so my earliest lesson in terms of security working for the DOD actually happened on this summer job because I came in one morning and uh, opened up the safe and there was a pink slip in the in the drawer that had the, the the handle on it, and it said, come see us in the security office. So it turns out that I had uh, left the office the night before. I guess I was the last one out, and I had left the safe open. And I'm a you know young kid, college student, and I'm thinking, well, what's the big deal? You know, so I left the safe open. Um, we're in this building that's surrounded by barbed wire fences. It's like this whole campus. You know, people just can't get in off the street. And even if you do get into the building, you have to get past the security desk. There's guards, there's turnstiles, you have to have a badge. And even the office that I was in had a, a lock on it. So not, you know, even if you were in the building, you couldn't get into the office. And they even had security guards that would roam the whole, the halls at night and obviously check all the offices and try all the safes to make sure that they were locked. So, uh, you know, I was kind of young and naive, but I thought, gee, you know, there's all these different layers of protection. What's the big deal if I just left the safe unlocked? Um, 
my boss was a little bit upset at me, but we got through it. I, I got written up, and I think something you know went into his record as well because he's the one that had hired me. Um, the second time I did it later on, uh, he was apoplectic. And uh, and what happened the second time was I think I had closed the safe and spun the dial, but I don't know if you've ever participated in any lock picking or seen anybody trying to do safe cracking type of exercises. Sometimes when you're spinning those dials, you have to spin it a couple times to get all the cylinders to fall. And apparently a lot of people would do it, were lazy and they would do a quarter turn and it would appear to be locked, but they could come in in the morning, do the quarter turn back. Well, the guards knew all the tricks, so I got written up a second time. I don't think that was my intent. I think I just had spun it and didn't know you had to spin it a couple times. But that was my first experience in what I would call data security. This idea that, uh, I broke a rule, I broke a process. So let's keep that in the back of our minds. We'll get back to that in a little little bit. So moving on to the question of what is DOD level security. Um, in my travels, especially the last couple of years, and even this year, talking, you know, giving this talk, um, I've asked people what they thought, what their thoughts are. I've asked for impressions, and I get this idea, and it this even goes back to that guy that said, "Yeah, we don't need DOD level security." I get the impression that people think DOD level security is this ultra high level, you know, to the nth degree of security, you know, when you need a little bit more, when you need that 11. Does anybody know what that movie is by the, but go ahead and say it. <laughs> but you remember the movie. Yeah. What's the movie? If you give up, I'll tell you it's Spinal Tap. Or I guess technically the movie is We Are Spinal Tap. I think it's the name of the movie. But I think that's a lot of people's impression. You know, DOD security is like, it's, you know, no holds barred. You know, every, you get to buy one of everything. You've got unlimited budget, unlimited resources. So you get to pack everything in. Um, and certainly in my career, uh, when I worked for the DOD, there was lots of different aspects to security that I learned about. And I just went out and just tried to find, you know, some of these, tried to remember some of them. There's some new ones since I've been around, but, uh, you know, all these things, trans, these are all abbreviations, communication security, comsec, transmission security, transsec, infosec is information security, opsec is operational security, msec is emanation security, and so on and so forth. Uh, signals intelligence, satellite intelligence, communications intelligence. It goes on and on and on. There was lots of different disciplines. There was lots of different aspects to security. Uh, and this is just scratching the surface. There, you know, there, there's more today, especially as more technology comes around. You got to have a, a, a new name for the discipline that, that, that approaches the security of whatever the technology is. Um, but as I, as I reflected on, uh, you know, what makes DOD level security different or what makes it stand out to me? One of the things that really stood out to me, going back a little bit to my early experiences, when I first started with the DOD, and especially when I started working at NSA, which was over 20 years ago, the whole organization, the whole company, if you will, the business was security. Everybody understood security. Everybody understood their role. Uh, everybody understood their part, and and everybody sort of knew the mission, if if you were. And the mission was, in many cases, security. Um, you guys have probably heard of or seen some form of a basic risk equation. I like to simplify things, and the, the way I learned the basic risk equation when I was at NSA is, you know, the risk is what's left over, or what what remains after you take into account and identify all your vulnerabilities and all your threats, and you basically apply countermeasures or apply what we would call security to it. Vulnerabilities being weaknesses, I think most of us are familiar somewhat with that term because that's sort of what this industry has been built on. Um, and it can be bugs, it can be misconfigurations, it can also be failures and processes. Threats are the bad guys, the way I learned it. Um, threats very often these days are, are expressed as the, the methods, the ways that the bad guys are getting in or the, the attacks that they're launching. So there's variations. And then countermeasures, I just think of it's the security. Um, what's interesting to me about the basic risk equation is I think about it in the DOD is, uh, when you think about the risk that you're talking about, the risk is really, if you think about it, human life. 
uh, you know, it's our national security, it's our armed forces, it's our military, it's our, uh, you know, State Department workers and, 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 uh, and anybody that's working overseas on behalf of the, the country. And we even protect our citizens when they're travelers and all that type of stuff. But it all boils down to one way, shape, or form, human life. Um, some of the things that I, that I noticed that were different about the DOD that I don't see so much in the, in the quote unquote real world these days is this concept of data security. We talk about data security, but in my years of going to companies, and I've been to hundreds of companies as a consultant, as a QSA, um, the data classification that is talked about in the commercial world is basically, we don't care about it, it's, it's unclassified, or we do care about it. So it's company sensitive, company confidential. What we don't do a whole lot in the, in the commercial world, in the real world, is try to come up with different types of classifications for the different types of data. Whereas when I was in working for the DOD, it was, it was ingrained in us that there was different levels of classification and that, uh, the reason that you protect data, uh, and this is sort of classic. Most people know these things, the idea of confidentiality, integrity, and availability. Um, but the, the, the idea that there is some data that you don't want stolen, there's some data that you want to make sure is real, that the integrity has been pres preserved, and there's some data that you want to make sure gets through, um, translates really well in DOD terms. And what was, what was, uh, taught to me was in terms of, uh, you know, like battlefield commands, if you're calling in an airstrike, um, you know, just based on recent news, if you're navigating a ship and there's other ships, you know, I haven't heard the details of how our ships collided or that our destroyer was uh, hit by another ship, but, you know, there was some sort of data security failure in there, I'll bet, as we, you know, as, as the news comes out. But, um, When I was a crypt analyst at NSA, the idea of data security, the ultra, the ultra level of security, the unbreakable system is a one-time pad. Um, I, I did this in my first couple years where you can't break a one-time pad if you use it correctly. If you protect the key and if you use it only once, you can't break it. Um, so we've been compromising ever since for speed and for, uh, for convenience. Um, so the guy said, we don't need DOD level security. Um, I've heard a lot of reasons over the years and even asking people questions the last couple months as I was putting this talk together. Uh, one of the common, uh, I think probably the most common belief is that uh, DO level, DOD level security is too expensive, it's too complex, it costs too much money. It's all about money, 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 money. Um, you know, people like I, the, like the, the customer I had that said, well, you know, we don't need it because it's just overkill. We don't have that much to protect. We just sell women's clothing. We just sell shoes. Um, certainly has been true that if, if you think about it in the last 20, 25 years before a lot of companies, especially ones that have been in the news lately, got on the internet, they really didn't care about data security and what, you know, information security, network security, internet security. They didn't have to. They, they had data. It was in a building and you had to, you know, there was a lot of physical security protections. They didn't have to think about the, the, the idea of data security, electronic security, all those different things. Um, I've had a lot of people say, especially in the Midwest, when I've had customers in the Midwest, ah, we're just a good old shop, you know, you know, everybody knows each other, one big family, nothing ever bad happens in, you know, uh, middle of Iowa or that type of thing. Of course, they're plugged into the internet and often we were there because bad things did happen to them. Um, I, I have trouble keeping up, keeping this slide current, but Every time I hear of a major breach in the news, especially in the last couple words, these words keep coming back in my head. We don't need DOD level security. And I keep thinking, yeah, you really do. Um, a couple years ago when the, uh, I forget which version of the malware, uh, point of sale memory scraping malware came out that hit Target and hit Dome, Home Depot. I even got a phone call from my old customer that said we don't need DOD level security because they were concerned whether that malware was going to affect them, whether whether the same thing could happen to them. So, you know, they over time, they were starting to pay more attention. But um, 
as somebody that's been in the business for a long time, many, many years, and somebody was the, that was trained classically in DOD security, trying to take it and teach companies in the, in the quote unquote real world about security, um, it's been a little bit frustrating and, and I've been doing a little bit of soul searching as, you know, what can we really do different? Because as much as we try to do security and I go to a lot of conferences, we hear lots of great talks about uh, all the different vulnerabilities and how to fix them and we need to do this, that and the other and, and have this kind of technology and developers need to be smarter and there's all sorts of discussions. But it all boils down to at the end of the day, for everything that we're doing, companies are still being breached. So a lot of what I'm trying to do here today is just to try to throw out some ideas of things that were done in the DOD that maybe we don't do so well these days uh, for various reasons. And, and, and maybe we can try something different because what we've been doing as an industry doesn't seem to be helping when big companies, major companies still get breached and bad things like malware and, you know, the bad guys have figured out how to make money off of malware. Uh, so, you know, and malware has become ransomware. So, um, in some ways as an industry, we don't seem to be winning. Um, that's just m my feeling and that's when I want to go to the city beer hall. Um, in my experience, you know, th there's probably a hundred answers for this, but what makes a network insecure? I think it's, it's partially lack of understanding, the lack of understanding of what security is holistically when you think of it as data security rather than uh, network security or uh, internet security. Um, certainly there's a lack of uh, very often, and I've been to companies of all sizes, there's, there's lack of institutional knowledge, there's a lack of understanding of security. Um, there's a lack of a commitment to the security. Very often there's, a, there's uh, as, even when I was doing PCI, there was a lot of companies that really didn't understand what the point was. You know, I know it's PCI, I know it's compliance, I know it has something to do with credit cards, but they didn't really understand what, the, what they were trying to do, which was to secure the credit card data, secure their customer data, and, and secure it everywhere it was. Of course, they didn't know everywhere it was. So they didn't, they, they had this lack of fundamental understanding, which, in a traditional DOD sense, uh, that understanding comes from very regimented policies and procedures, um, among other things. Uh, I think our industry hasn't really helped a whole lot because I remember in the early days of being in the private sector telling companies, well, you need to build a program, you need to have a policy, it all needs to be written down, you need to have standards for everything you're doing. And I'm paraphrasing, but too often it was, yeah, 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 what do I need to buy? How much does it cost? And when do I get that machine with the blinky lights and where do I put it? So there, there's, there just seems to be this, while, while it would be nice to do all that other stuff, it's very important we just need to drop some sort of technology in so we say we're good. In the early days it was we need a firewall and that was, then it was we needed an IDS system and then it was this and then it was that. And this whole industry seems to be built around coming up with new technologies to solve these new problems and if the salespeople are really good, they convince you, and I'm not berating anyone in particular, um, deriding anyone in particular, but, um, you know, vendors are trying to sell their stuff and, and it's, it's solving a problem. But, you know, nowadays it seems like there's thousands of problems and everyone needs a technology and there's probably six or eight or a dozen or 20 different solutions for each problem. I don't know how sometimes anybody makes sense of it. Um, a little bit of a personal thing, but, uh, in fact, I saw there was a, a talk earlier today. I don't know if any of you guys went to it. Somebody was talking about how penetration testing is dead. I certainly think there's an overemphasis on it. Um, and I think there's an overemphasis on vulnerabilities. If you keep in mind that, that risk equation, vulnerability is just one element of it. Um, the old, I hear too many people talking about risk and threats and they use the terms interchangeably. But again, if you remember the equation, a threat is a variable that helps you determine what your risk is. So here's some ideas uh, for what they're worth. Things that I'm thinking about maybe we should look at again or maybe we should reconsider and maybe there's some way to apply this to our world today and maybe maybe doing this will help make a difference. First and foremost, I think companies need to understand that what they're trying to accomplish more times than not is to protect data, is protect information. 
too much of the time the focus and the money and the resources and the attention are all spent on securing the infrastructure that presumably has the data, but if they don't have that basic understanding of what the data is, where it flows, who uses it, how does it come into the organization, how does it leave the organization, should it leave the organization at all. Um, if you had taken the uh, hacker trivia, one of the questions was, uh, uh, you know, it's, you know, a movie quote and what movie is it from? So one of the quotes is, um, we're at war, friend. I'm paraphrasing. I don't have it exactly memorized. We're in a war, friend, and the war is not about who has the most bullets. It's how, about who controls the information. Sneakers. And they're actually sitting, I'm sure it wasn't real. It was a mock up, but they're actually sitting on a Cray supercomputer. Um, which used to be the supercomputer of choice when I was in the DOD, and now there's one in the NSA Cryptologic Museum. If you ever make it to Maryland, you can see one of those for real. Um, I think the biggest difference in, term of the, in terms of the risk-based security model in a commercial context as opposed to or in, compare and contrast to the, the traditional DOD model is we start to put some idea, we, we start to put some costs into this. And as I said earlier, uh, the idea of data classification or the value of data, I don't think is understood. But it, it, as you think about it too, every aspect of this equation now in a commercial sense has to have a dollar number associated with it. You know, the vulnerabilities that exist and the money you spend to try to either prevent them from happening or detect them to, to figure out something, you know, whatever it is you're doing to figure out what's, what, what the problems are, whether you're monitoring, whether you're doing any types of scanning, that all costs money. Identifying the threats, that's kind of a new thing. Threats kind of the new, some companies are out there talking about threat detection and threat identification and, and this, that, and the other threat. Countermeasures is, again, traditionally all the solutions you put in place. But overall, if you think about the risk model in a commercial sense, the risk that we're talking about, whatever that value is at the end of the day, is really a dollar figure. Companies that are you know, commercial businesses, they're in it to make money. Um, they've got profit and loss statements. They have, they have to have a budget. They have to decide how much they wanted to spend to do all the different security things to lower the risk. So it all becomes a dollar figure, whereas if you recall the DOD thing, the risk is really human life. I actually acknowledge that's probably a big, big difference, and I'm not sure it's ultimately surmountable. But my belief is uh, if you at least have a better understanding of what all the component parts are, Hopefully, you're, as a as a company, as an organization, you're making a more informed, dis, uh, you know, spending decision before you invest in all those different solutions or, that are out there. And maybe you'll determine that you need to invest more in training for your people, or uh, maybe you'll break down and do the the policy and the processes and 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 the documentation that helps drive a lot of these other decisions. Um, yeah, you know, I, I was talking about the data classification. Um, in the government, and whether you've worked there, or whether you've seen it on movies, you know, there's, you know, everybody's, most people are familiar with top secret is like the big thing, you know, might have been in the news recently, things about leaks of, uh, of data. But, um, in the DOD, one of the big differences between these data classifications are, are two different things. One is, uh, and this is what sort of comes out in the media these days, it's not so much the information itself, it's where the information came from or how the information was obtained. We call that methods and sources. Very often top secret information is top secret because of how we're obtaining that information. It's the data source and that's the data source is sometimes how we do things that are when you start thinking about spying and surveillance and all that cloak and dagger stuff that's often where the data is ending up being top secret and you know confidential is you know more of a public source information or sources that are more readily available that book the hunt for red october when it was published back in early 80s the guy that wrote it tom clancy was getting in trouble and they tried to arrest him and pro I think maybe they did arrest him and tried to uh, prosecute him because they felt like his book had a lot of classified information in it but he had really written the book based on doing open source collection he found all sorts of public information and he made some 
uh, he drew some conclusions based on what he was reading, and apparently he hit the nail on the head and, and caused a lot of conster consternation within the DOD, within the Navy, um, because he was apparently guessing right on a lot of the technology and what a lot of this stuff meant. But, you know, his, his, his source of information was unclassified information. Um, the life expectancy of data is the other big thing. And what the, what was how this was explained to me early on was if you think of a battlefield, and you know you've probably seen a war movie here or there where there's a, a, a platoon or a group of soldiers and they're pinned down because there's an enemy machine gun nest or they're getting uh, hit from uh, mortar fire or artillery, so they call in an airstrike. Um, it's really, really extremely important that that information that they're calling in is accurate. You know, they're calling in grid coordinates, latitude and longitude. Really, really important that, that latitude and longitude is real. It's them calling it in. It's accurate, and they're dropping the bombs on the bad guys. Um, so extremely sensitive. But after the airstrike ha has happened in the next 15, 20 minutes, 30 minutes, or whatever, that information is not really that valuable anymore. So uh, life expect expectancy of data. In the commercial world, especially like in PCI, credit card information was considered financial information. Most, most companies I worked with kept all their financial records for at least seven years. So they were storing years and years and years worth of credit card data, full uh, you know, uh, uh, transaction data from their sales records. Um, and they did that because it was required, but they, but even uh, after the seven years, very often they wouldn't want to throw it away because a lot of accountants just don't like to throw anything away. So this idea that you know data at some point does not have any value anymore, so you can get rid of it, you can dispose of it, is not something that I see very often in the commercial world. Then there's this whole concept of security in depth, is what we used to call it. Um, in the networking world, we sometimes call this segmentation. Uh, there's other names for it, but uh, not a new concept. This is an aerial photo of a of a uh, of a town or a city that's I believe it's in Italy and it was built in the medieval times, so 14, 1500s. And you can kind of imagine where the whoever the lord of the manor was would be if there was ever any kind of an attack. And, and you know, so the perimeter sometimes it's uh, moats, sometimes it's trenches and ditches and roads, but. You know, I think most people sort of understand the more valuable information, you put it deeper in. Um, and we had this concept within the DOD, uh, but even before the whole networking concept, one of the concepts of protecting data and protecting information was not necessarily to provide ultimate protection. You can't ever get to it ever, but to make it harder for the adversary to get at it. Make them go through hoops, make them go through layers. We've done that a little bit in the networking world. Um, unfortunately, the bad guys, they, they too often find shortcuts and workarounds. But, the, but even then, the, the idea of data isolation or, or, or protecting the data and making it harder, um, what I see is still we try to protect the, 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 the network. We try to protect all the technology, and we think we have to do it to the same degree wherever it is. And I think that's not practical, and I think most people, if they sat down and thought about it, would acknowledge it's just not practical to protect everything at the same level. There have to be decisions made. There have to be trade-offs. There needs to be isolation. Um, this is a, a, a uh, sanitized network diagram that I collected from one of my cu PCI customers a few years ago where PCI initially says protect everything, but then somebody read the small print and said if you could segment or isolate your credit card environment away from the rest of your network, you can take systems out of scope. So uh, in this diagram, uh, you've got a you've got corporate data center or headquarters, you've got a sort of a production area, and you've got a couple examples of their retail environments. The things that are in red circles are what they identified as the card data environment that were supposedly separated and isolated from everything else. How many people are buying that just based on what you can see? Pretty complicated. Um, I think back to uh, my early experience with leaving that safe open and, and the thought that I keep coming back to is when I was there, when I first started working for that naval organization back in the 80s, everybody in the company, everybody in the organization 
understood security, understood their role in security, understood the importance of locking the doors, of locking the saves, of spinning the dials. Um, in some offices that I've worked at, they've had magnets that's, that you put on the door and one side says open and one side says close. So you could visually look and you you know, everybody was trained that open the safe, flip the sign to open, close the safe, flip it to close. So it was just like a, a reinforcement of, of, uh, is this, uh, layer of protection enabled? Is this step, is this process been followed? But, that's one example the you know the idea that there's fences around the buildings you know it wasn't just fences there was fences in some of the buildings different buildings i've worked in over the years there were motion detectors at detectors attached to the fences uh some of the fences might have been electrified uh i don't think many of them were certainly some of them had barbed wire or concertina wire there was perimeter guards that would drive around and just constantly inspect because very often, uh, especially when there was motion detectors, they'd be set off by squirrels and, and you know, if, the, if there was a windy day, a big pile of leaves could set it off. But it wasn't just a fence and we were done. You know, same with the, the front desk. I, I went through different periods where in the early days it was a picture badge. Later on it became an RFID and there was an automated gate. In the early days, there was a, a, a guard that had to look at the badge and was supposed to be looking at the face on the badge and my face. And sometimes we'd play games and see if we could go in on everybody else's badge and we'd switch with, you know, somebody that was female or somebody that didn't, that had a different shade of color to our skin or things like that. And sometimes it worked and sometimes it didn't. But there was processes built around that. Uh, one of the organizations I worked in, they would rotate the security guards very frequently, not, and not just, you know, on a, taking a break and change every couple hours. Nobody had a permanent post because they didn't want anybody to get facial recognition and know anybody that was coming in and just let them in. It's like, oh yeah, Jeff, yeah, you, you're here every day. Come on in. No, they didn't want them to get to have facial recognition and know people. You wanted, the guard should have been a stranger, so everybody's a stranger and everybody gets treated equally. He's got to look at the badge. We went through a period during Desert Shield, Desert Storm, where not only did the guards have to look at the badge, they were supposed to touch the badge. And I guess they complained about it, so they ended up getting these telescoping wands. It's like they ripped the antenna off, off a, a you know, transistor radio and they would touch the badge at a distance. And that's how they, they, they met their requirement. But, uh, you know, the, the, the doors had locks on them. The, the locks had to be changed uh, periodically, you know, much like we're supposed to change our passwords periodically. And, you know, the security staff that would walk the hall, everything that I kept thinking about was, you know, these things, while they were in and of themselves, meaning maybe not that meaningful, it, they all worked together for a goal. And everybody understood, uh, other than the young college intern, that they all worked together and they all worked together to provide the, the right level of security. And they were, they were enforced and they were determined based on written policies and procedures. Um, we came up with this idea that security is a, is a life cycle. You know, 20 years ago when I was first working for an organization outside of the DOD, uh, I, I live in Maryland. A lot of people I worked with were ex-DOD. I've known many people that were ex-DOD that have taken their knowledge out into the commercial world. And we all have variations on this. But what we try to emphasize is that security isn't really a state that you get to. It's something that you do. It's an ongoing thing. Um, in the early days, we were trying to sell vulnerability assessments, penetration tests, try to explain to people why it was important before they plugged into the Internet with their entire internal network they needed to figure out what, what their problems were because they had pre-existing networks. They hadn't started from scratch. So we came up with this concept of you measure or you assess and then, but you also need to build a strategy. You need to have a mission statement. What are you going to do with security? What kind of company are you? What kind of data is sensitive? When and where and how and for how long do you need to protect it? So you need, then need to build a solution. You need to implement it. And, and at some point you need to measure how well you're doing. So the audit process becomes important. We used to advertise this life cycle in the early days as being sometimes a 12 to 18 month process or even longer. You know, a, a, an engineering process, three to five years, especially if it involved technology implementations. 
nowadays, this life cycle can uh, come full circle sometimes in weeks, sometimes it seems like in days, depending on what the threats are, depending on what's happening in terms of technology, depending on what's happening in, the, in terms of the company mission. Um, the DOD has given us, uh, you know, their attempts at frameworks. Does anybody have to use, I'm sorry, does anybody use the NIST cybersecurity framework or are familiar with it? You know, it's pretty exhaustive, it's pretty extensive. But if you look at the functional areas, they're not a whole lot different from that that we came up with 20 some years ago. So I think there's a lesson in there that there's a, there's a way that you do security and, the, and there's a process to security. Um, you know, I've said a lot of this already. The, the life cycle is, you know, you start with knowing what you're doing. You know, what is it that your business or company or organization or, or customer, as it were, is about? And how does security fit into the completing the mission? Where does it fit in? Write it down. Um, people don't like the, the term policy. You can think of it as a strategy. Put it in business terms that they understand. Make it part of the business. Um, to me, this is all, you got to write it down and you got to have a plan is really the bottom line for it. Um, does anybody know what that is? This is old timey stuff. This is um, a set of documents that is basically an exhaustive standard on how to secure every type of device that's, that might be on networks. It's collectively called the Rainbow Series. Um, the first book that was published doesn't look my laser's working. Up on the top left, the book is orange. It was called, wait for it, The Orange Book. And it was published in the early 80s, I believe, something like 1983. And it was basically the Bible of how do you protect systems that you start plugging into networks. Lots and lots of detail. Um, the second book that was published was basically how do you interpret The Orange Book. It was about twice as big, twice as thick as The Orange Book. <laughs> And you can see it's gone on from there. Um, and while that might seem kind of silly, I think a lot of times I talk to people and they think the DOD or the, the government goes overboard in terms of process and documentation. But I saw this not too long ago when I was putting this talk together. Some, and it's hard to read on the big screen, but if you can remember the name of it, CISO Mind Map, you can Google it and it's, it's pretty large format. You can read at it. But it tries to break up everything that a CISO that's in charge of security for an organization is supposed to be aware of and supposed to know about, kind of breaks it up into various disciplines, which are sort of the darker boxes. And within the dark boxes, there's these sub-disciplines. I would guarantee you that probably 95% of the things that you're reading up there are tied to a specific technology solution, which personally I think is overkill because I, I'm, a, I'm a firm believer that what's going to make a difference ultimately is, is the process and understanding how security works before you go to the technology. Not saying it's not all necessary or important, but too often the technology is put out there without an understanding of how it all fits together. What's the overall goal? This is another example uh, similar where somebody tried to, to, to identify and cluster all the different domains that fit under this thing that's called that word up there that I refuse to say. Um, you know, there's a lot of stuff up there. Um, it's complicated. I, I, I continue to, to try to suggest that there's no way that you're going to do it well if you're just taking this shotgun approach without having an overall comprehensive understanding of what your goal is, what your mission is, what your strategy is for doing security in your organization. So it boils down to, this is a fairly common uh, description of how the components of security work. Uh, everybody familiar with this? Anybody not ever heard of people, processes, and technology to describe how security is carved up? My conjecture is ultimately, yes, those are all appropriate, but it all starts with your purpose, understanding, okay, we're a whatever type of company and we have this type of data that we need to protect and not only this type of data, but four different types of data, whether it's, uh, you know, confidential research information for the company because the company builds something or it's employee information or it's the information that's uh, uh, involved in the, the business dealings of the company, mergers and acquisitions, or even what, they're, what you're charging to your various customers if you're like a wholesaler or it's your customer information. There's different types of information that need to be protected in different ways for different amounts of time. 
and there is more and less sensitive data. Um, so to wrap it all up, it's really all about the information. It's all about the data. It's not just the, the technology that the data is residing on. Um, technology to me isn't really ever the solution, never will be. And more and more it's the problem is there's more and more technology out there that for every problem that is solved, it seems like a new problem is introduced because of the capabilities or features of the new technology. Um, security is something you do. I, I like to say security is a verb. I didn't mention that word at all. And uh, at the bottom, the bottom line for me, what I can do as an aging veteran is to just try to uh, share my knowledge and try to teach people as much as possible. Knowledge, 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 awareness, security is more than just the technology that we throw out there. It's more than just the, the, the cool stuff like breaking into things as a pen tester and stuff like that. Um, real briefly, uh, I'm working as an advisor and evangelist for a company called Cybrary.it. They are an online open source uh, resource for I'll say the word now, cybersecurity. Uh, they have lots and lots, something like thousands of different courses, higher level stuff like what I'm talking about, training in a lot of different products. Um, sign up for free, Cyberary IT. Um, even if you're a company, uh, if you happen to work for a company that has a product and you want to put your product training courses out there, if you have uh, demos of your product, they want it. They want everything. Uh, their big claim to fame is they have over a million subscribers now, um, and they've only been in business for about two years. So there's a million people that are that are taking the the uh, courses. They offer offer various micro certifications. There's some stuff that you have to pay for if it's like pre you know one of the industry certifications, but probably 90 95 percent of the material is available online all the time for free. And if you go out there, I've even got a course out there now. I teach a course on uh, learning effective communication skills that I call the art of the Jedi mind trick. I have no idea what we're doing on time. Does anybody have any questions, comments? Does what I say make sense that we need to do something different? Throw eggs at me. Disagree with me. I don't know that it ultimately works. Or should we head to the city beer place? Oh, we have to have closing ceremony. Any questions, comments? Am I going to finish it? Really? I did not know that. I w well, I finished it. I gave it all to them. So I <laughs> That's weird. I yeah, okay. I'll talk to them about it. Um, well, what'd you what'd you like from what you saw so far? <laughs> okay. You just want more. Interesting. I'll I'll talk to them about that. That thank you. I appreciate the feedback. Um, have five stickers for free on them. Uh, any other questions or comments? Okay. Hmm. Back to questions and comments. Well, it's a whole lot easier to over, over classifying is a problem in the DoD. Yeah. Okay. Uh, in my day, it was very often over classifying. Like when I was, you know, when we were starting to do pen testing and trying to figure out how to do it, and we were sucking down tools and learning tricks and a lot of the early days of hacking it's, it's changed completely it was just understanding how stuff worked and sort of finding undocumented features or or you know tweaking parameters here and there but as you know even if we'd read it on the internet or if things like nmap we download it as soon as we touched it our lawyers wanted to classify it top secret I gave this talk uh, earlier this year to an ISC squared meeting in Northern Virginia, and uh, so there's a lot of DoD contractors or 
you know, working directly or indirectly. And um, there, somebody commented that uh, the DOD now is doesn't have all this institutional knowledge anymore that they go out to private industry to try to learn how to do security, which I thought was ironic. I was at a conference this past week, and I met a guy that works at NSA, and he does red teaming for him. And he said he had just started an assignment in, out in the commercial world to like a six-month tour with a commercial company to learn how they do security. I'm like, wow, that's really sad if you knew what I was doing this talk about these days. But it is what it is. I mean, when I worked there, there was decades of institutional knowledge. Security was something that evolved. And it was, it was we used to call it a game of cat and mouse, you know. We figured out how to do something. The bad guy figured out how to defeat it. We figured out how to fool them and, and hide something. Eventually, they'd figure out how to defeat it. And it went on and on and on. That I don't think that's changed. I mean, I don't think we ever get to the point where, OK, we're secure. We're impenetrable. But a lot of people think that's what security means. I don't know. If you're a vendor, you just keep making money as long as you get a product that sells. But I think there's a lot of I think there's a lot of burnout out, out in the real world of companies that are tired of spending the millions of dollars and they get breached anyway, tens of millions of dollars. Well, that well that's the whole thing we don't even talk about. If you're targeted, give up. But most companies aren't still today targeted. It's still targets of opportunity. Target was a target of opportunity. Home Depot was a target of opportunity. Any other comments? I do have some stickers from Cyberary if you're interested in them. And uh, a card that says my name on it, just as a reminder. Feel free to grab them if they haven't melted. <laughs>